This video will quote extensively from a current affairs article on Peterson, so hop on over there and have a read if you don't want to hear some of its points from my smooth radio voice. Okay, all right, what the hell? Address the Jewish question. That's a hell of a thing to ask. So that's Jack Lintern, you know? I mean, really, that's a hell of a thing to ask. But I will say something about it, you know? Let's move on to another Petersonism. If you've listened to him for a while, you would have noticed how he loves to appeal to nature. This is known as a naturalistic fallacy, in which he will discuss something that happens in nature and assume it hence must be good and right. The most popular and meme-tastic one is his lobster hierarchies. Okay, well you say antidepressants work on lobsters. Yes, they do. In they make a lobster that's been defeated in a fight more likely to fight again. That's not the same mechanism that it's happens the same in mechanism. humans. Because yes, lobsters it is. It's don't get depressed mechanism. as the way that humans are. I think you're anthropomorphizing into a ridiculous degree. These are I creatures that, that urinate out of their faces. The implication being that lobsters have hierarchies, and by extension, human hierarchies, whether justified or not, are natural. You can carry this even further by implying that those at the top of both hierarchies, human and lobster, are rightfully taking their place there. Of course, appealing to nature is a fickle thing, as many animals, and particularly humans, rely on mutual aid. Also, again, lobsters pee from their faces. That doesn't mean that human beings should find a way to pee from their faces as well. Again, if you were to say what Peterson is implying to him, he would deny it and respond with something equally vague like, natural things are sometimes okay, but not always. Also, you would think that a rational professor made entirely of logic and facts, the destroyer of feminists, who has extensive experience reading academic publications and in debate and whatnot, would know better than to cherry-pick results. Something that particularly grabbed my attention was not how he frequently makes unfalsifiable statements, but by how he also doesn't check his facts. I assumed, as he is an academic, that I wouldn't find outright inaccuracies when it comes to facts, but Peterson has surprised me yet again. Equally surprising for an academic, when reading, he seems to either misunderstand because of a lack of reading comprehension, or he reads into a text what he wants to believe, much like an ideologue. To illustrate this example, we can take a look at his reading of George Orwell. He claims that he was convinced out of being a socialist here. My college roommate, an insightful cynic, expressed skepticism regarding my ideological beliefs. He told me that the world could not be completely encapsulated within the boundaries of socialist philosophy. I had more or less come to this conclusion on my own, but had not admitted so much in words. Soon afterwards, however, I read George Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier. This book finally undermined me, not only my socialist ideology, but my faith in ideological stances themselves. Bullshit. In the famous essay concluding that book, written for, and much to the dismay of, the British Left Book Club, Orwell described the great flaw of socialism and the reason for its frequent failure to attract and maintain democratic power, at least in Britain. Orwell said essentially that socialists did not really like the poor, they merely hated the rich. His ideas struck home instantly. Socialist ideology served to mask the resentment and hatred bred by failure. Many of the party activists I had encountered were using the ideals of social justice to rationalize their pursuit of personal revenge. Something, as a side note, that I find a bit funny is that apparently socialists exist outside of the poor, or any social class for some reason. He notes socialists don't like the poor, they just hate the rich. In my experience, most socialists I've met have been fairly poor, working class people. So you're saying that they don't like themselves, essentially, or people like them, their parents, their co-workers, their friends, they just hate rich people. It's a weird sort of thinking that he has. Anyways. Here is what The Road to Wigan Pier actually says, which Peterson says convinced him that the error in socialists is that they hate the rich. Please notice that I am arguing for socialism, not against it. The job of the thinking person, therefore, is not to reject socialism, but to make up his mind to humanize it. For the moment, the only possible course of any decent person, however much of a Tory or an anarchist by temperament, is to work for the establishment of socialism. Nothing else can save us from the misery of the present or the nightmare of the future. Indeed, from one point of view, socialism is such elementary common sense that I am sometimes amazed it has not established itself already. The world is a raft sailing through space with potentially plenty of provisions for everybody. The idea that we must all cooperate and see to it that everybody does his fair share of work and gets his fair share of provisions seems so blatantly obvious that one would say that nobody could possibly fail to accept it unless he had some corrupt motive for clinging to the present system. To recall it from socialism because so many socialists are inferior people is as absurd as refusing to travel by train because you dislike the ticket collector's face. The article summed it up best. 
Orwell flat out says that anybody who evaluates the merits of socialist policies by the personal qualities of individual socialists themselves is an idiot. Peterson concludes that Orwell thought socialist policies were flawed because some socialists themselves were bad people. I don't think there is a way of reading Peterson other than as extremely stupid or extremely dishonest, but one can be charitable and assume he simply didn't read the book that supposedly gave him his grand revelation about socialism. How can this man be so popular? I can't personally put it better than Nathan Robinson. Peterson is popular partly because he criticizes social justice activists in a way many people find satisfying, and some of those criticisms have some merit. He is popular partly because he offers adrift young men a sense of heroic purpose, and offers angry young men rationalizations for their hatreds. Now, his fame is also not that surprising since from the looks of it he has been trying for years. Hell, I don't even think half the stuff he says he means. It's all for that juicy 60k a month he gets from Patreon, I'm sure. His rise to prominence came because he opposed and misunderstood Canada's Bill C-16, which added gender expression and identity to the list of prohibited grounds of discrimination in the Canadian Human Rights Act. He claimed that under that bill, he had to use a student's preferred pronoun or face prosecution. He, of course, is wrong, and nowhere in the bill does it say that failing to use someone's preferred pronoun is a criminal offense. He goes on to claim that this was a totalitarian ideology being promoted, yada yada, all that nonsense. This trend is continued in, for example, the interview with Kathy Newman, where he compares trans activists to Mao Zedong. His reasoning is almost hilariously bad. You can say the inverse, and according to his own logic, it would still make sense. Have a pause here and read. Now, putting aside that right-wing politics are very much identity politics, and putting aside that the millions dead as a result of Mao is disingenuous to say the least, Kathy Newman has every right to be confused at what he's saying. Why? Because what he's saying is a non sequitur, it makes no sense. A country finally emerging out of feudalism in the grips of fierce class struggle during the largest revolution humanity has witnessed is in no way comparable to trans activists trying to get people's preferred pronouns respected. He wonders how there could be any difference between transgender activists and Mao's China, then is told that the difference is millions of deaths, then denies that transgender activists are going to cause millions of deaths, then says they follow a totalitarian philosophy that drives people to commit mass murder. Oh, and just interesting side note, he compares trans activists to Mao, but he tries to sue a university for comparing him to Hitler. Hmm. This is just another entry in the long list of things he doesn't understand, misrepresents, or states opinions with inconvenient conclusions that he always backpedals out of in order to maintain his objective facade. He doesn't understand politics, or even worse, holds reactionary ideas that he tries to push onto the world through his groundbreaking work. I suspect it's a mix of both. Take for example his opinion on what one should do in order to cause change. Remember, since he was so against student activism, then maybe there is something legitimate that he has to offer as an alternative. Do you think we, like when are there changes that are desirable to be made and how would you want to see them implemented if not through policy or through activism the way that certain groups currently are promoting? Well, back, you know, this happened in the 60s as far as I can mm -hmm. tell that we got this misbegotten idea that the way to conduct yourself as a as a responsible human being was to hold placards up to protest, to change the viewpoints of other people and thereby usher in the utopia. Mm. It's like, I think, I think that's all appalling. I think it's appalling and, and I think it's absolutely, it's, it's absolutely absurd that students are taught that that's the way to mm. conduct themselves in the world. First of all, if you're 19 or 20 or 21, you don't bloody well know anything. You haven't done anything. <laughs> you don't know anything about history. You haven't read anything. You haven't supported yourself for any length of time. You've been entirely dependent on your state and on your family for the, for the brief few years of your existence. And the idea that you have enough wisdom to determine how society should be reconstructed when you're sitting in the absolute lap of luxury protected by, mm -hmm. by, by processes that you don't understand is absolutely, I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a bad, let's call that a bad idea, sure. shall we? <laughs> and, then we? And then the idea that what you should do to change the world is to find people who you disagree with and shake paper on sticks at them. And <sighs> An opinion that can only emerge out of the lap of luxury he disdains so much. 
People striving for civil rights in the 60s, trying to finally bring at least some semblance of equality between African Americans and whites to stop the oppression and murder of blacks in the streets of America, which continues to this day, by the way, is seen by him as a bunch of children who know nothing about the world holding up a bunch of signs. People trying to end the Vietnam War, an illegal invasion and occupation on made-up pretext that resulted in millions dead was nothing more than arrogant brats holding paper on sticks. Imagine the fucking gall Peterson has to say to the likes of, for example, Huey P. Newton, the man that founded the Black Panther Party in 1966 at the age of 24, that he knew nothing of the world. It's those very people, minorities, people of color, those in the third world, that know all about oppression and hardships. But Peterson, who had a comfortable middle-class upbringing in Fairview, Canada, has the right to be a condescending prick to those that worked and even died to make the world a better place. This sort of nonsense can only come from someone that has never had to campaign for his own rights, who had always taken everything he has for granted. He's a straight, white, educated male in the Imperial Center, after all. Addendum. There's nothing wrong with being a straight, white male. I happen to be a straight male too, just not white. What I'm just trying to say is, as he is a straight white male, he cannot understand the sort of struggle that people of color or minorities have to go through to get recognized, let alone be appreciated and respected. To him, as a man who wouldn't have had to fight those sort of struggles at that time during the 1960s, he views people who are just trying to get their rights as just, you know, oh, they're brats just protesting for no reason. What, would, what do they know about the world? They're just kids after all and so on and so forth. Nathan Robinson said it best. Here's where Jordan Peterson's self-help routine connects with his politics. Peterson seemingly discourages all serious political involvement. He says cultivating the self and reading great books is more important than any possible political action. Don't focus on changing the world, focus on tidying up your life. After all, the meaning of life is to be found in the adoption of individual responsibility, and when you win everything, everyone around you wins too, because it means you shine a light on the whole world. 12 Rules for Life makes it explicit. Stop questioning the social order. Stop assigning blame for problems to political actors. Stop trying to reorganize things. Have you taken full advantage of the opportunities offered to you? Are you working hard in your career or even your job? Or are you letting bitterness and resentment hold you back and drag you down? Have you made peace with your brother? Are there things that you could do, that you know you could do, that would make things around you better? Have you cleaned up your life? If the answer is no, here's something to try. Start to stop doing what you know to be wrong. Start stopping today. Don't blame capitalism, the radical left, or the iniquity of your enemies. Don't reorganize the state until you have ordered your own experience. Have some humility. If you cannot bring peace to your household, how dare you try to rule a city? Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. How incredibly convenient. And since, as even admitted by him, nothing is fully perfect, meaning one's house can never be in perfect order, so you can never criticize the injustice in this world. Paradoxically, he's inviting you to inaction. Armchairism. Also something interesting is by reading great books, he would probably suggest to you some of the works of Solzhenitsyn, who is a Russian nationalist and anti-Semite that made up quite a lot of what he said as admitted by his wife. So mm, take what he says with a grain of salt. Peterson speaks to disaffected millennial men, validating their prejudices about feminists and serving as a surrogate father figure. Yet he's offering them terrible advice because the individual responsibility ethic makes one feel like a failure for failing. Oh, sure, his rules about standing up straight and petting a cat when you see one are innocent enough, but you shouldn't tell people that their problems are their fault if you don't actually know whether their problems are their fault. Millennials struggle in part because of a viciously competitive economy that is crushing them with debt and a lack of opportunity. African Americans might suffer because of their race. Women might suffer because of their sex. These are struggles that he doesn't qualify in any sort of way. Sure, Peterson might train guys to be more brutal and tough-minded, and a few of them will do better at that economic competition I mentioned earlier. But if you can't pay your student loans or your rent and you can't get a better job, what use is it to tell you that you should adopt a confident lobster posture? Quick fire round. Here are a bunch of points I couldn't fit into the general narrative of the video, but I still want to include them, so here they are. Mr. Freethinker over here wants to commit non-violent warfare against gender, ethnic, and racial studies, sociology, anthropology, and literature courses. Taking this nonsense to its logical inclusion, you could say that he wants to ban such things or ban great works of humanity like Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, Edward Said's Orientalism, Angela Davis's Woman, Race, and Class, 
Of course, he'd vehemently deny this, as he always denies everything that he insinuates, no matter how obvious what he's saying really is. He claims Marxists won't debate him, even though he cancelled a debate with Douglas Lane. Hell, the guy has a $75,000 speaking fee, meaning you have to pay him exorbitant amounts just for him to show up. He tells you to beware of single cause interpretations and beware the people who purvey them, but postmodernism and postmodern neo Marxism is apparently responsible for everything wrong. He is somewhat of a Nazi apologist, whether intentionally or unintentionally. The Germans had plenty of reason to be resentful and, and hateful because, I mean, think about what they went through. We can't even imagine it. The, first of all, there was World War I, and so there was many men, like Hitler himself, who served in the trenches. And there's one story about Hitler. He, um, he won a medal for heroism in World War I, and uh, he was sitting around with a group of his buddies and went off to do something, God only knows what. And when he came back, they were all dead because a, a, a mine had, uh, not a mine, I don't remember what kind of, some kind of shell had landed in the middle sure. of them and killed them all. Mm -hmm. It's like, that changes you, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, there was all these brutalized men who'd come out of the trenches. I mean, you just can't imagine what it must have been like in the trenches, you know? Especially if you're there for like a couple of years, you aren't the same person. Get out of there, you're unemployed, your country's in ruins. Then the hyperinflation hits and every single person in Germany who ever saved any money at all is flat, bloody broke. Mm. And then there's a communist revolution brewing in Russia and it's like, it's hell. <coughs> and the Nazis came along and said, well, not only are we going to restore order and greatness, but we're going to bloody well tell you whose fault this is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, and Hitler, I've studied him a lot trying to understand what happened. And Hitler was... Carl Jung called him the mouthpiece of the collective unconscious of the German people. So you imagine there's all this resentment and hatred brewing underneath the surface and all this, this chaos is there and the desire for order is like clamoring in everyone's minds. And Hitler comes along and he's, he's a very powerful emotional orator mm. and he's watching the crowd and he listens. And when he says thing A, nothing happens. When he says thing B, everybody roars. Hmm. And so he takes note of that. And it's not even conscious exactly, right? Because he's being molded by the crowd. And so they roar. And so we think, so that's a reinforcement. That's a reward. And so then he goes down that line a little bit farther and they roar some more. And then he tries mm -hmm. something else and it's silent. He becomes what they want. You bet. Yeah. Exactly yeah. that, man. He, he acts out the dark desire of the mob. Mm -hmm. So he becomes the embodiment of the dark desire of the mob. And that's partly, that's partly why he had the charisma. It's right, because there's this unconscious fantasy brewing in the back of everyone's mind. Zay underscore NABQ comments on this particular clip and mentions some interesting points. Jordan Peterson argues Hitler and the Nazis were doing what was only normal and logical given the circumstances, thus baiting them. That's textbook Nazi apologism. Notice also that Jordan Peterson places Nazis who were responsible for World War II and the Holocaust and hence all subsequent deaths, not only of the Holocaust, but every single death in World War II. He sets them on the side of order and communists and socialists on the side of chaos. That is Nazi propaganda. Presenting themselves as stability against the threat of cultural Marxist chaos, or back then it was Judeo-Bolshevik. Uh, essentially just a little bit of a change in terminology, but he means essentially the same thing. If you're peddling the same sort of stuff that Nazi propagandists did back in the day, then maybe you're on the wrong side. He's an intellectual hack making an ahistorical claim, prefaced by the war heroism of Hitler and working to make the sentiment behind fascism seem more human and understandable to his target audience of crypto-fascists and pepes who loathe perceived chaos of others. Also, Hitler wasn't swayed by the roaring crowds to espouse more radical ideas. He refused to join the Austrian army in World War I because they were too racially mixed. His radical racist views were solidified long before he became a leader of the NSDAP. I'm so glad H3H3, one of the most popular YouTube channels and Jewish himself, lets Peterson rationalize Hitler's rise to power with no interruption or pushback. It's real freaking neato how YouTube centrists promote far-right figures and talking points. Nothing but good things can come from this. Finally, there's already a mountain of material covering his sexism, critiquing his work, quote-unquote work, fact-checking him, etc, etc. For the inquisitive person, he's already been discredited. I wasn't the first, and I'm definitely not going to be the last. One thing we do know, however, is that he's just another transient member of the conservative circle that'll become irrelevant as quickly as he became the closest that academia has to a rock star. And that's it. 